And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. It's 1.30. Up next, Making Contact. This week on Making Contact. And what you're doing is inspirational. This is the strongest movement in America. It began as a protest by a few students and teaching assistants over deep budget cuts, but quickly turned into a history-making movement of working people in Wisconsin. But was the occupation of the state capital in Madison a resurgence of organized labor in the U.S.? Or was it the last gasp for unionized workers as they face continual erosion of their rights? Do not let us lose the ground that we have reclaimed. On this edition, we hear the second of a two-part retrospective documentary on the 2011 Wisconsin Uprising, produced by Workers Independent News and WORT Radio in Madison. I'm Andrew Stelzer, and this is Making Contact, a program connecting people, vital ideas, and important information. Part one of this documentary left us on Sunday, February 27th. Following Governor Scott Walker's move to take away the right of unions to collectively bargain for better wages and working conditions, thousands of Wisconsinites had occupied the state capitol and its grounds for almost two weeks. Fourteen Democratic state senators left the state, leaving the legislature without a quorum to do business and stalling the anti-union bill. Then, on February 27th, the Republican-controlled state legislature ordered the Capitol in Madison to be closed to the public at 4 p.m. That's where we pick up the story, narrated by Workers Independent News correspondent Doug Cunningham and featuring some of his reports from throughout the dramatic few weeks. This is Doug Cunningham, Workers Independent News. I'm in the Capitol Rotunda on the first floor of the Capitol in Madison, Wisconsin. This is longer than an hour after police have said that this area should be cleared and thousands of protesters are still here. The chant that just went up was, Officers, join us. And officers have indeed joined them. There are Madison police officers among us. There are firefighters among us here on the Capitol Rotunda on the first floor. Despite the fact that the order came down more than an hour ago, the protesters had to leave the Capitol building here in Madison. This has been a remarkable series of protests lasting longer than 13 days, and tens of thousands of people have participated, and firefighters and police officers have supported this, and now thousands of people are still here in in the Capitol Rotunda, refusing to leave despite an order to do so about an hour and a half ago. These protesters have respectfully occupied the People's House here in Madison, Wisconsin for days ever since Governor Scott Walker attempted to take away collective bargaining rights for public workers. Fourteen Democratic senators remain in Illinois blocking a vote on that collective bargaining bill, and these protesters are as defiant as ever. A protest yesterday in Madison drew over 100,000 people, the largest demonstration yet in this remarkable historic action. This is Sunday, February 27th, and these protesters have remained completely peaceful, completely respectful to the police officers involved that are watching over them here, and so far police have made no effort to clear this rotunda here in Madison. State Representative Brett Halsey urged the protesters to leave if asked by the police. Law enforcement is on our side. The police union is supporting us. We need to be very respectful for them. But this unidentified young woman invoked Gandhi in an impassioned plea to hold the line and keep the people's house. Spirited chants went up in an incredible spirit of nonviolent resistance as protesters stayed put. The 
deadline came and went and thousands stayed, most on the first floor rotunda. Drums and chants energized the protest. Then a cheer went up when it was announced that State Senator Dale Schultz, a Republican, had announced his opposition to the bill gutting collective bargaining, the first Republican senator to join Democrats opposing the bill. Shortly after that announcement, protest organizer Erica Wolf shared the news that police would not move against the protest and people could stay another night in Wisconsin's capital. What's going to happen is the cleaning crew is going is to finish cleaning up the floor downstairs because they're so awesome and they want us to be happy and safe. Yeah. Wisconsin's working families, their unions, and their 14 Democratic state senators continue to stand united in their battle for collective bargaining rights. To this is what democracy looks like, Wisconsin's Worker Uprising, produced by Workers Independent News in conjunction with WORT Community Radio, Madison. I'm Doug Cunningham. On March 2nd, groups in many parts of the state began to organize recall campaigns aimed at eight Republican senators. A statewide group entitled Recall the Republican Aid established itself. The movement came into being because union and political leaders saw no willingness on the part of so-called moderate Republicans to break with the governor when it came to the budget or collective bargaining. Democratic Party activists have been joined by hundreds of other volunteers who go out each weekend and on many weekday evenings to get signatures. In Wisconsin, elected officials can be recalled after they have been in office one year. The recall petition process lasts 60 days from the time petitions are first signed. In general, about 20,000 signatures are needed to recall each senator. Once certified, the elections can take place about eight weeks later. The recall movement reflects the deep negative reaction to the governor and to the means by which he has tried to achieve his political goals. Since mid-February, there have been an average of six meetings per night in different cities throughout the state as enraged citizens come together to discuss the budget cuts in education and other services. Wherever the governor goes, he is met by demonstrations. The recall effort is an expression of this anger. As of April 3rd, petitioners had collected over 20,000 signatures in the conservative southwestern district of Senator Daniel Kapenke, 5,000 more than needed to force a recall. Petitioners were also closing in on another Wisconsin senator, Randy Hopper, who was based in Fond du Lac region of Wisconsin. In this case, according to newspaper reports, the senator's wife signed the recall petition. Recall, if successful in changing the makeup of the Wisconsin Senate, can stop the bleeding. Changing the makeup of the Senate will not be able to reverse the legislation. However, if Democrats succeed in winning the recall elections, it will set the political stage for the recall of Governor Walker, slated to begin the day after he has served one year in office, January 3rd, 2012. As Governor Scott Walker and Republicans at Wisconsin's Capitol turn what had been the police velvet glove into more of a state patrol steel fist, police and firefighters continue to stand in solidarity with their public worker brothers and sisters protesting in Madison. When the Capitol lockdown began Sunday afternoon among the protesters staying after the deadline and risking arrest for the cause of collective bargaining was Maylin Mitchell. Mitchell is president of the Professional Firefighters of Wisconsin. Well, we're staying united with people that we've been united with from the get-go. We have firefighters actually scattered all around here. Uh, we're mingling with our brothers and sisters. We're doing what we've done pretty much every day this week. Uh, we also have uh, cops here as well. This has been a peaceful rally from the start. It continues to be a peaceful rally. There's nobody here agitating anybody. And so uh, I would hope that uh, they continue to let the people speak like they have for the week and, and continue to let us have a peaceful rally. Mitchell says that fire Firefighters are here to stay and see the struggle through with their brothers and sisters in other unions. We've had firefighters here all night, all week. I mean, we're, we're doing it in shifts. As long as people are in the Capitol, you will continue to see a firefighter presence among the other brothers and sisters in a union. 
Madison police officer David McClurg was one of the many police officers also with the protesters risking arrest as the Capitol was to be cleared. They were wearing Cops for Labor shirts. We came realizing that, you know, at 4 o'clock that we may be arrested and fully accepting that. We feel it's an important enough thing to do. And we stand with all the people here and, and we just uh, hope that someone in the Republican Party in Wisconsin has, uh, has uh, what it takes to, to realize that this is just plain wrong. Officer McClurg says he was particularly disgusted by Governor Scott Walker admitting he had thought about planting troublemakers in the peaceful crowd of tens of thousands of pro-labor demonstrators. I can't believe that anybody within the state of Wisconsin can't see that and see the the, uh, the lack of honesty and the immoral you know acts of our governor. I mean, as a police officer, as someone who upholds you know the the Constitution of, of Wisconsin, and I, I just I'm, I'm shocked by it. Dane County Sheriff David Mahoney has withdrawn his deputy sheriffs from guarding the Capitol doors, saying that his officers are not part of any palace guard and will not block the Capitol doors to the public. It's now been 13 days since a 1,000 students and members of the UW-Madison Teaching Assistance Association marched to the Capitol to protest Governor Walker's union-busting budget bill. Hundreds of thousands of people have joined daily Capitol protests both inside and outside of the Capitol building. The Capitol City occupation that started as people waited to testify at public hearings on the bill has completely transformed the stately Capitol into a true people's house. Colorful protest signs and big protest banners cover the walls on every floor. The rotunda reverberates night and day with sounds of protest, solidarity, and defiance, the drumbeat of democracy. Protesters peacefully defied efforts to end their occupation Sunday, February 27th. The 14 Democratic state senators remained in Illinois, stopping the Republican attack on unions in its tracks. Wisconsin's worker uprising captured the imagination of the nation and the world. Ian's Pizza in Madison was flooded with workers buying food for protesters occupying the Capitol. Donations poured in from every state in the union and at least 14 nations to provide free food to sustain the occupation. National union leaders, including AFL-CIO President Rich Trumka, came to Madison. Some celebrities made brief appearances. Walker and the Republicans, though, are now beginning to use the state patrol controlled by the father of the two Republican brothers who run the legislature to restrict access to the Capitol in an effort to choke off the occupation in advance of his budget address. On Friday, March 4th, the remaining overnight Capitol protesters left the building peacefully, but only after a court order that guaranteed protester access to the Capitol the following Monday. We'll be right back. You're listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. If you'd like more information or for CD copies of this program, please call 800-529-5736. Because of listeners like you, this show is distributed for free to radio stations in the U.S., Canada, and South Africa. To find out how to support us, download shows, or get our podcasts, go to radioproject.org. And the feeble strength of one, but the union makes us strong. Return to the second of a two part retrospective on the 2011 Wisconsin Workers Uprising. Produced by Workers Independent News and WORT Radio in Madison and narrated by Doug Cunningham. Despite a court order to open the Capitol to protesters, working families arrived to find the People's House locked down with access even for reporters and legislative staff severely curtailed. Legal efforts continue to enforce the reopening of the Capitol as protesters locked out loudly demand entrance. Governor Walker delivered his budget address March 1st in a locked-down Capitol with a hand-picked audience as he continued to defy the court order ordering the Capitol open to protesters. Amazing grace, how sweet 
Wisconsin Senate Republicans passed a resolution Thursday calling on police to take state Senate Democrats into custody for contempt of the Senate. It's not an arrest warrant and doesn't come from a judge. The Wisconsin Democrats say they didn't flinch at the news and are staying put in Illinois in defense of collective bargaining for public workers. The Wisconsin Professional Police Association slammed the Republican action, saying using forcible detention of elected officials because they won't allow you to dictate with a free hand is an unreasonable abuse of police power and is insanely wrong. Dane County Judge John Albert said Thursday he'll issue an order saying the state of Wisconsin has closed the Capitol impermissibly, but ordering overnight protesters to be peacefully removed. The order lifts the access restrictions imposed by the state. Former State Attorney General Peg Lautenschlager, the lead attorney for the unions seeking a more open Capitol, said the state had restricted access to the point that people could not exercise their free speech and assembly rights. The Wisconsin Capitol remained locked down Thursday as a court hearing continued to win open public access again. Even as a reporter, I had a hard time getting in on Thursday. This is what getting in sounded like. Hi. Hi. Would you like to get into the building, please? On the opposite side is the entrance. There's only one entrance open? The entrance is on the opposite side. C- could you explain to us why the judge's order is not being honored and all doors open to the public? I mean... Gayla Olson of Black Earth, Wisconsin, describes what it was like once she managed to finally get into the Capitol building. We had four police officers around us, okay? Four police officers, and then we had to be escorted by two police officers just to get out of the building. It was like a police state. Everywhere you go in this Capitol now, police are here and the hallways are empty. Just about 100 protesters in the rotunda downstairs pounding on a drum. Police everywhere asking for IDs. This is not the people's house anymore in the Wisconsin tradition of how it normally is here. And people are gathered outside, hundreds of them, in the cold. And they are angry about this. And they are demanding to be let inside as they express their passionate disapproval of the lockdown of the people's house. Inside, about 100 demonstrators are still here who have been spending the night here and right now there's a drum circle going on in the Capitol rotunda here in madison keeping the drumbeat of this protest this pro-worker protest alive here in madison wisconsin democratic state lawmakers like representative fred clark again set up their desks outside thursday to protest the lockdown Independent news. During the Capitol lockdown, Republicans, in a surprise and legally suspect move, rushed the gutting of collective bargaining for public workers through the Senate and into the Assembly for final passage without a single Democratic senator present. As Democratic State Representative Peter Barca protested that it violates the state's Open Meetings Act, Republicans controlling the Senate Assembly Conference Committee ignored him and rushed to vote as protesters chanted, Shame. With the fullness and most complete information about government affairs, Representative that's Barca. compatible with the conduct of government Representative Barca. If there's any doubt, Clerk Paul Roll. No, no, excuse no, me. No, no, listen, it Paul, says if there's I, any doubt as to whether good cause exists, the governmental body should provide 24 hours notice. This is clearly a violation of the Open Meetings Law. Now, look, you've been shutting people down. It is improper for you to move forward while this is a violation of the Open Meetings Law. You're not allowing amendments, and that is wrong. Now, I, I, Mr. Chairman, this is a violation of law. This is not just a rule. It is the law. There must be... No, Mr. Chairman, this is a violation of the Open Meetings Law. It requires 24, at least two hours notice. What have you done? On Thursday, March 10th, Republicans rushed the collective bargaining bill back to the assembly for a final vote so the governor could sign the bill gutting collective bargaining rights for public workers. The Capitol was still locked down in violation of the court order. And this is what it sounded like as protesters outside the building tried to get in for that assembly vote. Hold 
the law. This is Which illegal as hell. What are you doing this for? Bar the door to the people, the people against the law. For labor out here, you have firefighters out here. These are the people of Wisconsin, and you guys are barring the door in violation of the law. You're not upholding the law. Join us. Get on our side. Let us in. to walk through the press entrance with permission from Capitol Police to cover the story, I was strong-armed, shoved, and grabbed by the Wisconsin State Patrol. What? What are you doing? What are you, what are you putting your hands on me for? Wait a minute. What is this? I'm a member of the press corps. Earlier, Workers Independent News had applied for Capitol Press IDs, which must be approved by the Capitol Correspondents Association. Association President Jason Stein at first denied us our press IDs because we have union officials on our board of directors. It must have something to do with the fact that we uh, cover workers' issues and we're connected with unions and we have union members on our board. I mean, that's got to be it, you right, know, right, right. right? And that's it. So why is that an issue, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, why is that your position? Why, why does that make, why does that matter when on the face of it, it, it seems pretty absurd that that connection could get us disqualified from this Capitol Press Corps club, and yet you guys, who are funded by corporations and have corporate connections, are perfectly fine. The association later gave us IDs, but our permanent IDs are still unresolved. With thousands of Wisconsin workers locked out of their capital, Assembly Republicans rushed through a final vote gutting collective bargaining for public workers. National labor leaders like AFL-CIO President Rich Trumka were amazed and inspired by what they saw of the workers' uprising here in Wisconsin. What you're doing is unprecedented. What you're doing is amazing. And what you're doing is inspirational. This is the strongest movement in America. You're stronger than your governor. United Steelworkers President Leo Girard told the Madison rallies that solidarity forever will see us through. They're never going to divide us, and we're going to stand together one day longer. The men and women standing behind me tonight, just like the firemen, you want to try to move a steelworker on that capital, come and get us. OPEIU President Mike Goodwin says the Madison resistance to having these human rights taken away from workers is inspiring and remarkable. I'm just so inspired by seeing the people here and, and just the camaraderie of the, of the labor movement. It's just a wonderful feeling. I've been going to rallies for 50 years and I don't recall being at an event so powerful and so inspiring as what's going on here in Madison, Wisconsin. Legal challenges were filed immediately after the Republicans passed and signed the bill. And on March 12th, more than 100,000 protesters again rallied at Madison's Capitol to welcome home the Fab 14 Democratic state senators and to continue this struggle. Wisconsin's Fab 14 state Democratic senators who had been blocking a vote, destroying public worker collective bargaining, returned from Illinois to a hero's welcome in Madison. to thank the people who have with their voices and their marches and their rallies here in Madison and around the state to protest the stripping away of the rights of employees in the state of Wisconsin. They have inspired us. They have created a new dynamic, a new political dynamic in the state of Wisconsin that says respect workers, respect citizens. We are here to join them in that fight. Senator Fred Risser is in his 80s and has been serving in the state Senate 
since the 1950s. The war is not over. The fight for workers' rights is continuing. It's a real privilege to participate in this, and I want to thank everyone who has helped us on this. The people, the, the, the crowds around the Capitol, we watched those on TV, and they were stimulating to us, and they kept us going. It's a, a remarkable experience. It's not over yet. The battle to recall senators who voted to gut collective bargaining is underway. Workers' rights under attack. What do we do? Money and signatures for the recalls, including one aimed at Governor Walker, were being collected at the rally. It's about the recall. I thought you couldn't do it until January. Yeah, we, we're trying to get names now for, for January and for the senators as well. The remarkable and historic Wisconsin workers' uprising continues. Workers' Independent News executive producer, Dr. Frank M's back. One result so far of the Wisconsin uprising is that many now see that union rights and human rights are linked. But that relationship is a reciprocal one, and maintaining union and community ties is a continuing challenge. The Wisconsin uprising has shown that people can and will come together to defend basic rights. Community and union members have stood shoulder to shoulder to defend quality public education. They oppose the sacrifice of the environment on the altar of so-called budget cuts. Thousands of high school students also mobilized in their own behalf. They are the future of the political and union movements. It is unlikely that they will be satisfied if their dreams are deferred or ignored. Wisconsin citizens have also demonstrated they don't want to be insulted and taken for fools by leaders using shady legislative maneuvers and deceptive campaigns. But much more is going on, perhaps beneath the surface. Union members, workers throughout Wisconsin, are contemplating what to do if they are stripped of their collective bargain rights and their organizations are crippled. Will political action be enough? In the past, both in Wisconsin and in the United States, legislation that recognized worker rights has come about after direct action on the job resulted in a political response. Will history repeat itself in Wisconsin and elsewhere? The Democratic Party has been a recipient of much goodwill here in Wisconsin. Many workers who had been disillusioned by the actions of Democrats noted that the 14 Wisconsin senators finally stood up for working people when they fled the state and prevented the passage initially of the anti-worker legislation. But what will this mean for 2012? Will this goodwill play out in the national elections? National Democratic leaders, including and especially President Obama, have been nearly invisible here in Wisconsin. There was no national outcry by the administration to defend the rights of workers to collectively bargain. The labor movement has attached itself to the Democratic Party for many years. With the Wisconsin uprising and the clear demonstration that huge and thousands of people were demanding leadership change that relationship. Meanwhile, the budget and unemployment crises continue. Will the Wisconsin uprising lead to a rethinking of budget and tax priorities with the result of a more equitable tax system and recognition that public services are the basis of civilized society? The events in Wisconsin may be the beginning of a revival of the labor and progressive movements. The signs suggest it, but only time will tell. That's it for this edition of Making Contact. You've been listening to the second half of a retrospective documentary on the 2011 Wisconsin Workers' Uprising. This program was produced by the staff at Workers' Independent News, including Frank Emsbach, Jesse Russell, and Doug Cunningham, with contributions by WORT Radio in Madison and Molly Stenz. Log on to laborradio.org to order a CD of the full-length one-hour documentary. You can also do that at our website, radioproject.org, or by calling the National Radio Project at 800-529-5736. Check out our website, radioproject.org, to get our podcast, download past shows, or help make a difference by supporting our work. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. Jane Fonda.
the fabulous, outrageous star of nearly 40 films, is going to be in Berkeley on August the 17th. And this is Chris Welch, and I get to talk with Jane on stage about her phenomenally dramatic life. I mean, just consider some of the men. Henry and Roger Vadim, Tom Hayden, Ted Turner, and then there's Jane's powerful feminism. She co-founded the Women's Center in Gloria Steinem, her controversial opposition to the Vietnam War, her ongoing work with Eve Ensler, her Academy Awards, Golden Globes, not to mention her best-selling works on health and fitness. Plus, we'll discuss her big brand new book, Prime Time, and oh, just be there. August 17th, 7.30 p.m., First Congregational Church, 2345 Channing in Berkeley. It's a KPFA benefit. 